cover the same set of topics that were listed in the program, and the first is spectroscopy. Thank you very much. So good afternoon to everybody, and uh, first of all, let me say that I'm uh, extremely happy to be here, and I'm very grateful to have been invited to be a lecturer at this uh, school. Uh, in part also because the first time I actually came to Jerusalem was 10 years ago in 2006, so for a very similar uh, school, I was a student back then, I was also much younger, and uh, I really, really enjoyed that. Uh, I thought it was an extraordinary experience, both for the place and for the school. So coming back 10 years later as a lecturer is really a great privilege. Okay, back to Exoplanet. Um, First of all, just to introduce a bit the topic, I will cover more the um, atmosphere of exosolar planets, but more from a chemistry point of view, uh, also for differentiating a bit from our lecture that you heard in the past uh, days. And uh, the first question you need to ask is why, why do we bother about understanding the atmospheric chemistry of this exosolar planet? Um, well, for several reasons, actually, and uh, in particular because uh, the uh, atmospheric composition of this extrasolar planet might be a way to get the insight of our physical and chemical processes that are not necessarily only linked to the atmosphere. And so, in particular, the chemical composition of the atmosphere, uh, uh, we believe, is influenced by the formation processes, potential impacts in the history of the uh, formation evolution of the planet, escape processes, we've already heard the lecture from uh, Ruth uh, yesterday about uh, atmospheric loss. Um, also interaction with the stellar radiation um, have a strong impact both through photochemistry and also climate. Um, of course, if there are some condensation processes, uh, formation of clouds, uh, the, uh, the overall chemistry will change. And if we're talking about terrestrial planets, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, the composition of the interior might influence the composition of the atmosphere through, for instance, our gassing processes uh, through volcanic activity. And I think also importantly, although for the moment we only know one uh, really habitable planet, the Earth, uh, we know that at least on our planet, uh, the presence <laughs> of life through time uh, modify quite dramatically the composition of our atmosphere. And so, as a consequence, we might think that similar processes might happen to as well. So I will not go through these aspects uh, in depth today, because it's actually more um, at the topic of my third lecture, but I just wanted to set the scene a bit. And uh, all this would be very interesting, but just very speculative, if we didn't have the chance, really, of measuring what is the chemical composition of these atmospheres. But actually, we're quite lucky because in this moment in time, we have uh, 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 at least a couple of techniques that we can use uh, to probe the uh, atmospheric composition and also the thermal structure of these faraway atmospheres. I'm afraid we cannot really go there, but these techniques are actually quite powerful, at least uh, in giving us the information uh, through spectroscopy of uh, um, these faraway atmospheres. And the two main techniques, although then there are some sub Sub subclasses of these techniques are, of course, transit and direct imaging. Uh, in one case, uh, we are using basically the relative position of the planet with respect to the star to separate out uh, the contribution of the planet. In the other case, we're using a coronagraph uh, or a different device basically to null out the contribution of the star and focus on the planet. Of course, these techniques have been used uh, also to discover new planets, uh, both can be used in fact to detect planets, but what I'm talking about here is actually not necessarily focusing on the white light coming out uh, of these uh, techniques, but more uh, looking at this light as a function of wavelength and really uh, start to use spectroscopy as an insight <coughs> of what is happening in this faraway atmosphere. So again, another reason I think uh, why it's uh, uh, quite interesting and important to study atmospheres is because since they're made of gas, you can actually use spectroscopy and so the, all the processes of emission and absorption um, of the photons by uh, the gaseous particle really to get inside of what's going on. And so actually today I would like to use this first lecture to focus a bit more on this uh, a more uh, um, uh, basic sort of aspects, so how we can use spectroscopy to get 
some insight about this atmosphere, uh, what, can we, what can we do really. And then uh, the second lecture will be more focused on uh, current observation and so sort of, of application uh, of what today we're looking at more from a theoretical perspective. Before I continue with this, I, I would actually like to use uh, um, the um, blackboard. And I believe I learned how to do this. Let's see if it's true. Yes. Don't have to go to the ah, OK. Thank you. Otherwise, it's quite uh, dark, so, yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, so before we care about splitting the light in multiple wavelengths, I just wanted to start with very basic consideration. And in particular, I wanted to look at the uh, energy balance equation. Basically, here I have a star with a radius Rs and a temperature Ts. And I have a planet that is located at a distance d from the star. And my planet has uh, a radius Rp and a temperature Tp. Um, now, I'm considering, uh, just the first order approximation, that uh, my star is emitting like a black body. And of course, this is not entirely true for several reasons. There are some absorption lines. And if we look at cold star, even some absorption of molecular um, features. But certainly, if we go in the UV and X-ray part of the spectrum, then definitely is not the black body a five uh, at, at the temperature of the photosphere is actually uh, emitting a temperature which are much higher than the one of the corona um, and the chromosphere. But in first order approximation and just focusing on the star as a black body and also my planet as a black body. And uh, the incoming radiation in this uh, approximation, incoming radiation as a uh, per unit time, is given by sigma temperature of the spiral power 4. Um, this is a watt per square meter. Um, then uh, um, it's arriving, this is the amount of energy per unit time that is emitted by the star, but of course my planet is located at a distance d, so I need a dilution factor because not all these photons are arriving on the planet. And uh, the dilution factor goes like Rs squared, so the radius of the star squared divided by d squared, conservation of energy. Um, also, the surface uh, uh, that this radiation um, uh, is covering, well, first of all, only half of the planet is illuminated. And on top of that, if I look at the direction of this incoming radiation with respect to this is the planet, uh, this is the normal to the surface. Basically, the incoming radiation form an angle uh, with the normal to the surface, and so when I integrate uh, this information over half the hemisphere, what I obtain is a pi. So I have a pi, radius of the planet squared. This is the surface that is uh, illuminated. Um, also, although I said that my planet is a black body, let's say that uh, my planet actually has uh, some property uh, to reflect back part of the radiation, then it means that the only incoming radiation will be a uh, diffraction that is not reflected back. So it's 1 minus a. And for a, I mean the albedo, so a parameter that goes between 0 and 1. 1 is a complete reflection called bit realistic, and 0 means uh, uh, that I have a black body. So this is the incoming radiation. And of course, I'm making no distinction about uh, um, the dependence of this radiation as a function of wavelength. I'm just integrating overall uh, the entire black body spectrum. 
In a situation where the incoming radiation is equal to the outgoing radiation, um, the outgoing radiation, well, first of all, it will, it will be uh, a radiation that is coming out of the planet. And in this case, if my planet is rotating relatively fast, um, the entire planet will actually emit back radiation at a temperature um, corresponding to Tp. And so since it's the entire planet that is uh, uh, emitting radiation is the surface is 4 pi radius of the planet squared. And then also here I have uh, Stefan Boltzmann equation, sigma temperature of the planet power 4. Um, now, in the case of uh, um, a black body uh, sort of radiation coming from the planet, then that's it. But if on the contrary, I'm assuming that rather than having really a black body, I have a sort of gray body. And so I'm emitting a bit less than what it would emit uh, for a black body. Then I have another parameter here that I call epsilon, the emissivity, parameters that goes between zero and one. Uh, epsilon equal one is the black body. And the more this is uh, close to zero, the more radiation I'm retaining and the more I have a sort of greenhouse effect for the planet. So, of course, one way to use uh, this uh, energy balance equation is uh, to derive uh, the temperature of the planet through this very simple sort of uh, equation. And uh, I will quickly do that, although this is not really the purpose of writing this equation down. So temperature of the planet is given by the temperature of the star, and then I have square root of uh, Rs over D, and then I have uh, 1 minus A for epsilon here. Okay, the reason why I've written down this equation is that from a, a point of view, uh, when I integrate the entire radiation, um, then, of course, these two terms are equal. That's the assumption I made to calculate the temperature of the planet. But if I start to basically look at the radiation as a function of wavelength, uh, even in the uh, very poor approximation of having two black bodies, I already start to see some very interesting properties. Yeah? Is epsilon equal to 1 minus uh, No. Uh, actually is a very good question, and uh, we'll come back to this. Epsilon is more a filter at the long wavelength, uh, in the sense that it is uh, more related to the mission coming out of the planet, whereas the albedo is a filter at the short wavelength, and so is filtering out the incoming radiation from the star. So maybe this is not is a, still a bit confusing as a, an explanation, but I will actually uh, go through this uh, uh, in a few minutes. So epsilon so is equal to 1 minus a for the same frequency? Well, it depends. Equal. It depends in what kind of, if you're in equilibrium, this equilibrium. Right. Here I'm just looking at the entire planet. Everything is integrated over the, uh, the entire planet and everything. In particular, everything is integrated over all the wavelengths. And so this is really just a, a parameter, this one that is affecting more the short wavelength radiation, and this is more the long wavelength coming from the planet. I will try to, uh, uh, to come back to this point uh, right now, actually. Okay, so I was saying that if instead of integrating my black body over the entire uh, wavelength uh, and, and getting in this way uh, the Stefan Boltzmann equation, if I'm looking at the black body, at the Planck function that is coming from the star, of course, is the Planck function diluted by this factor uh, Rs squared divided by d squared. Um, and on top of that, I have a fraction that is removed because of the albedo. So the, um, uh, the intensity, uh, if again, in the black body approximation, uh, has a shape like this one, and let's assume that the star I'm considering is, is a star very similar to the sun, so about uh, 5,800 Kelvin, then the peak of the Planckian will be basically peaking in the visible wavelengths. And so it means that uh, the, uh, uh, most of the photons uh, are actually uh, with an energy 
uh, that is corresponding to the visible wavelength. You probably remember that the energy of a photon is equal h nu, uh, or if we want to use wavelength, is equal to h uh, c over lambda. Okay, h is the Planck function. So most of my photons, according to the distribution um, of this Planck function at a temperature t, which is equal to s, will have basically this energy. But this is very different from the case of my planet, because my planet <coughs> has a temperature tp that, uh, given that uh, d normally is much larger than rs, of course it means that the temperature is lower. And again, just uh, for the sake of an example, let's assume a temperature that is similar to the one of the Earth, around 300 Kelvin. Um, it means that the Planck function for a, a body of a 300 Kelvin, it will be basically locating a different um, part. Uh, distribution will be very different. And in particular, it will peak a wavelength around the 10 micron in the infrared. So now my drawing is not entirely correct, They're actually even more separated, but just to give you the, um, a feeling. Of course, if my star is uh, colder, it means that this Planckian will be uh, uh, shifted towards the uh, longer wavelength. If my planet is hotter, then this will be shifted towards the shorter wavelength, but I just wanted to make the point. Now, as you can see, even just in this very crude approximation, uh, although from a point of, from an energetic point of view, these two expressions are equivalent when I integrate over the entire uh, wavelength. Um, actually, when I, I, I draw these two distributions, they're very different. And what they're telling me is that although the integral of these two curves are the same, apart from some, some factors here, um, actually, the way I've distributed the energy of this photon is very different. Here, I actually have very energetic photons, a fewer number, of course, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to have the same integral. But here, on the contrary, the photons are much less energetic. And so immediately I see um, a huge difference here. And in part is this difference that is driving some of the uh, complexity um, in the uh, planetary atmosphere. Just an example that uh, come, come up uh, to my mind uh, is the process of photosynthesis. The process of photosynthesis is extremely efficient because if you think, well, you have plants which are living at the temperature of more or less 300 Kelvin, but they're actually using the information of photons that bear the information of uh, a body at 5,800 Kelvin. So it's actually uh, extremely efficient as a process because I'm using uh, a few photons coming from the star, and I'm able to do that because of this sort of separation between uh, uh, the distribution of the incoming photons <coughs> and the outgoing radiation. I don't know if it makes sense of this. So in the rest uh, of this lecture, I will actually like to focus on this part, on the diagram, so look more about uh, the uh, uh, outgoing radiation um, from the Earth. And uh, since the Earth actually, or in general, sorry, uh, of a planet, um, is not really a black body, but is actually a, a very complex, uh, especially the atmosphere, uh, a very complex situation where cellular absorption are occurring. And so see how uh, different from a black body is actually what I'm actually measuring, uh, the, the spectrum. And in particular, we'll also look more in detail at what really Epsilon and, and, and the albedo are, because it was a very good question. Um, we will see that Epsilon, again, is more linked to the um, absorption by a molecule that absorbs in the infrared uh, in the planetary atmosphere and retain part of the radiation that should be emitted back and somehow you emit it back less than what you're supposed to do if you were a black body. So if you're a black body, you're emitting with this curve. If on the contrary, you have an epsilon that is less than one, and you have uh, some uh, molecules which are absorbing, you will emit like this, right? And so the... the same temperature. Uh, yes, well... The reality of temperature will be higher to 
the, the temperature, of course, would be a distribution of temperature, to be correct, in the atmosphere. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to see this. If, if, if your atmosphere is all at the same temperature, even if you have some absorption, you wouldn't be able really to see this. Uh, but the net effect is that I'm emitting much less than what I would do. And so that's what the epsilon factor means. And actually, epsilon is, is something that is more of a function of wavelength and is a relatively complicated thing. But here it's just summarized as a very crude parameter. When it comes to the albedo, on the contrary, we'll look at the scattering property of the atmosphere and the surface, meaning how both the atmosphere and the surface basically can scatter back and so bounce back some of the radiation that is coming from the star. And so uh, how we can really quantify this parameter A, albedo. But again, the big difference is that the albedo is related to photons with this distribution and the emissivity is related to photons with this distribution. So in this sense, they're quite separated. Okay, let me go back actually to the PowerPoint presentation. I thought I understood, but probably not. Um. <coughs> Let's see, that is the... Ah, uh uh, yes, possibly, yeah. Where are we? Oh. Ah, yes. Yeah. Thank you. And also, let me go to the lines. Okay, so uh, we talk about doing remote sensor spectroscopy of this very far away planet, but the first question is uh, at what wavelength we want to look at uh, in order to probe the physical and chemical processes of this atmosphere. And actually, it, it is really important to uh, uh, decide what kind of spectral region you want to uh, look at because depending on the energies of the photons you will look at, you will actually uh, uh, be able to get some insight about different processes. So for instance, if you're interested, like me, in uh, uh, looking at molecules um, and the thermal properties of the atmosphere, then you need to stay in infrared. Um, if on the contrary, you're interested in probing uh, albedo properties, the clouds, the surface properties, then the visible is the right way to be. <coughs> If, on the contrary, you're more interested that ions, uh, um, at the very upper part of the atmosphere, molecular dissociation, uh, and root uh, um, already made electron, all this, then, of course, you want to stay uh, more in the X-ray or the UV part of the spectrum. So, again, I will not go through the UV photons because uh, Ruth already uh, covered this part. This is just to say um, that, again, in the very upper part of the atmosphere, uh, the gas is quite ionized uh, and typically uh, uh, UV photons are part of this ionization process and what you're looking at here is the absorption cross section for uh, two molecules that particularly in the Earth atmosphere are quite uh, effective in uh, uh, shielding part of this radiation, uh, molecular oxygen and ozone. So yeah, they sorry. Uh, so what you're looking at here is uh, absorption crook section, and I actually will go through absorption crook section several times um, in the lecture. Basically, what we're looking at uh, is this absorption crook section, uh, uh, which is in units of a surface uh, as a function of wavelength. And so here we are in the UV part of the spectrum. And so this is the uh, ability that molecules like O2 and O3 have uh, to absorb uh, UV radiation. Um, and as you can see, they're actually extremely efficient in blocking this part of the radiation. And uh, for us humans, this is actually very good because these are actually quite damaging type of radiation. So to have a several molecule that can shield this sort of very energetic photons is actually a very good, a very good point.
yeah, you're right uh, that you made, uh, in fact, uh, that, um, that comment. Okay, um, very quickly, visible photons, uh, mostly in the visible, more than being absorbed, uh, uh, the visible photons are basically scattered, so meaning uh, uh, molecules uh, or uh, particles or the surface basically uh, change the direction of the incoming photons from the star. We have said that most of the photons from the star, of course, depend on the temperature of the star, but most of the photons are actually, for a star like the Sun, uh, are actually located in the visible part of the spectrum. And most of these photons actually that bounce back this is actually what that was calling with albedo if you integrate over all the photons in the visible which are bounced back. That's, that's what the albedo is. Uh, occasionally they can also be um, absorbed and they can be absorbed, they're, they're still uh, relatively uh, energetic, not as energetic as the UV1, but we're still talking about a few electron volts. And so with this energy you can uh, definitely uh, uh, determine electronic transition. So basically a jump, uh, an electron can change uh, um, to a different level uh, due to photons like this. And for instance, molecule like oxygen has some transition in the visible. Um, mostly is more atoms, but uh, occasionally also molecule can have this, uh, this sort of absorption. Yeah? Yes? Uh, well, you're absolutely right. I mean, part of the energy that is arriving at the surface is bounced back. In particular, we, we will look at this. Uh, depending on the surface type, uh, you have different uh, reflection properties. Ice typically uh, is very re relatively very reflective. If you look at land or even the ocean, then it can absorb quite a lot. So you're right. Uh, I haven't been um, entirely true in saying that most of these photons um, uh, especially at the surface, uh, a, a, a great part are actually absorbed by the surface. Um, looking at infrared the photons, uh, here we're talking about photons that are typically, on the contrary, are less energetic. And uh, also here, depending, as we will see um, in the next few minutes, depending if our photons peaking in the near infrared or the middle infrared or the far infrared, it will make actually quite a difference in what is the interaction with the matter. But the, the most important thing that I want to make, uh, the point I want to make here, is that most of these photons actually are uh, not necessarily coming from the star, but are emitted back by the planet at the temperature at which the planet has thermalized. And uh, um, depending actually whether the temperature profile in the atmosphere uh, where, the, where the temperature is decreasing with altitude, increasing with altitude, depending on the thermal profile, the way these photons are emitted back um, will actually change. And actually we'll go through these processes quite in detail um, in a few minutes. And so in a certain sense the infrared uh, is extremely rich as a spectral region if you're interested in understanding what are the molecules absorbing, how abundant they are, um, because there are several transition in the infrared, but also what is the thermal profile of your atmosphere. And so really uh, uh, using this sort of spectroscopy um, as a thermometer um, of the thermal profile. Uh, I believe you actually gone through this equation with Adam, so I will just go through this uh, really very quickly. This is just to say that uh, if, uh, uh, if you're not looking at a black body uh, with a uh, plan function, but in general, uh, you're in, in a more generic situation where not necessarily everything is in equilibrium, uh, then uh, if you want to know what happens to um, uh, some uh, radiation intensity, I is the radiation intensity at a particular wavelength lambda, um, then if this radiation is going through a medium, uh, this radiation will be uh, either absorbed, and that's why in this part of the uh, equation there is a minus because this, uh, this part of the equation my initial intensity is actually decreasing because of the absorption and I can have some source function in the case I have uh, again some processes uh, that actually uh, can uh, increase the intensity. Let's focus for the moment on this, on this part and uh, if uh, the source function is equal to zero, so if j is equal to zero uh, then uh, it's relatively easy to integrate this equation. I have the Bourbouge-Lambert law, 
uh, the equation reduces to this and it's very easy to separate the variable and to get an integration like this. And this uh, solution tells me that if I start with uh, an intensity of radiation uh, I0, uh, then after my uh, uh, radiation has gone through the medium, some of this radiation will be absorbed and uh, it will decrease basically exponential. What is important here is to look at what are the factors that actually are determining uh, this absorption. Um, and in particular, the absorption is uh, uh, proportional, of course, to the path. The longer is uh, the path in your medium, if the medium is absorbing, of course, the more <coughs> radiation you will absorb. The density of your gas, if your gas is an absorbing one, of course, the, the more molecule you have, the more uh, uh, photons they will be able to absorb. But today, we'll probably more focus on this particular parameter that here uh, uh, is in the unit of uh, a centimeter square per gram, so surface uh, on, uh, uh, on mass uh, is the mass extension uh, um, uh, cross section. In some other cases, if, uh, if I'm using very similar um, uh, uh, parameter uh, cross section as uh, in unit of, um, of surface, then here instead of the density, uh, I will have the number density. But again, this is just uh, 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 semantic. Um, okay, this equation, uh, it, it tells me basically how much radiation is transmitted through a medium. Uh, and actually, this will be something that we, we will look again when we will talk about the current observation with transit, because actually, uh, uh, when you measure a transit effectively from a spectroscopic point of view, you're measuring some sort of transmission. Um, in the case uh, uh, where actually there is a source function, so rather than having uh, j equals zero, we actually have a source function, as a source function is actually uh, a body, a black body, with a particular uh, um, uh, photon distribution like the Planck function. Then, in this particular case, we have this Warshall equation, and again, I believe you've seen this uh, with Adam, so I will not really go through all the details. Uh, the only thing I want to point out is looking at the solution uh, of this equation that, of course, has a, an extra term, compared to the uh, uh, Bear uh, lambert um, uh, bouguet absorption. Um, basically, the solution uh, is given by the same solution you would have when the source function is equal to zero, plus the solution of the particular equation when you have the source function, and where this uh, source function is convolved with the transmissivity of the atmosphere. Uh, well, sorry, on the medium. In this, in this particular case, we're not yet at the level of atmosphere. Okay, as I said, more than going through all this equation that I believe you've already seen, I want to focus more on the crux section, um, and uh, um, which uh, in, 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 some, in some cases I call K because it was the mass crux section, is, uh, is just the crux section with the units of, uh, of a surface. So what is exactly this crux section? Well, this crux section basically tells me uh, how probable it is that a particular photon at a particular wavelength or frequency will be absorbed uh, by a particular molecule. So as you can imagine, this is actually a, a key information if you want to understand uh, uh, not only what are the gases absorbing in that atmosphere, but even if you want to know the concentration of these gases. And the reason for that is that, just to keep things simple, uh, look at this parameter here, the optical thickness. Um, if I'm able, basically, uh, to quantify this parameter k, or sigma, doesn't matter very well, it means that I can also quantify very well the density of the gas or the number density. And so it's quite critical to have a very precise number here, <laughs> because then I can go back and understand the concentration um, of my molecule. And. Uh, um, I just wanted to give you um, um, a few information about uh, how people measure or calculate this cross section because actually I think it can be quite important to understand a bit the physics behind, uh, behind it. So in general, uh, you have two parts for a cross section. One part, uh, um, which is basically uh, 
uh, the, uh, the intensity of, this trans of each transition. So again, it's linked with the probability that uh, a particular photons with a particular energy is absorbed or not by my molecule. And another part, we're basically we're looking more at, uh, um, at a line function, and we will see exactly what the line function is, integrated over a, a, an interval of frequency or, uh, or lambda. And this is, again, uh, because uh, uh, normally, especially when you do calculation, you don't necessarily look at all the single line transition, especially in the infrared, but you look at uh, an information that is more or less average in a relatively narrow spectral beam. Um, what is the transition intensity? As I said, it's linked to the probability to have a particular transition. And uh, uh, what I want you to get out of this expression here, which is quite complicated, uh, is simply that uh, uh, <coughs> there are many terms that actually depend on the temperature. And actually, for people who are calculating line lists, so basically cross-section as a function of wavelengths for each of the molecules, <coughs> it's extremely important that they do this calculation at the right temperature. Uh, you can, to a degree, and people do that to a degree when there is no other information, extrapolate the information that you have uh, of particular gas at a certain temperature. But actually, you're normally introducing a quite a large error if you do that. Um, uh, one <coughs> of the key points is actually this function QT here, which is actually the partition function, meaning <coughs> is the sum of all the energy states, o o o basically of, of, of terms like this one here, where you have the energy of the single state divided by KT. Uh, this is the energy of the single state, the initial state. In the QT, the partition function will sum over all the possible state. And so basically it has a function of a, a normalization. Apart from the dependence on the temperature, what is quite important is this coefficient here, which is the Einstein A coefficient, which basically tells me the probability uh, that uh, there is uh, a transition, in particular a spontaneous emission, and so the probability uh, that a particular molecule, a particular gas, at a certain point, emits a photon with a, a specific energy. Um, and uh, um, the Einstein coefficient actually is uh, it's not really dependent on temperature, but is actually depending, um, uh, to this term here, it is actually linked to the, um, uh, um, uh, to the dipole um, um, uh, um, momentum. So basically on the distribution, electrical dipole, so on the distribution of charges that I have in my molecule. So depending how these charges are distributed, um, and I will show you some example, but depending on the symmetry, um, then uh, this term can be uh, more or less large. And so it really uh, take into account uh, uh, the, the, the geometry in particular, the distribution of charges for each uh, different molecule. So how we can calculate, actually, this, uh, um, uh, this probability of transition? Well, first of all, the first thing that we really need to do, if you're interested in, in, in this type of, of work, is try to understand what are the energy levels which are actually allowed for a molecule. Uh, and after that, we know what are the energy levels that uh, we can get. Uh, then we can calculate, uh, basically, the wave function for the molecules, meaning uh, the probability, basically, that uh, these states are occupied or not. Um, okay, so if we're considering uh, a molecule, um, of course, uh, apart from the electron, we also have the nuclei, uh, and the nuclei of the atoms which are composing the molecule, they're not really fixed and static, but actually uh, they, they move, and in particular they rotate and they vibrate. Uh, the electron around them, of course, they have a smaller mass, and so to a degree they, they clearly move much faster. The way people can actually calculate what is really happening, and I will show you just briefly what is the uh, 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 equation that you need to solve if you want to look at the uh, problem in its in complexity. But uh, what people usually do is to use an approximation, which is called the Bohr-Oppenheimer approximation, where basically the motion of the nuclei and the electrons are treated separately. And this is re actually really a huge simplification. And because of this, uh, we can actually today <coughs> calculate uh, uh, actually uh, the energy levels and also the probability of transition or even very complex molecules. 
So this is a horrendously complicated equation. And uh, again, this is just to show you the different parts. It's not that I want to go through all the calculation. Isn't it? <laughs> That's what I thought. Now, I don't really want to scare you in this. <laughs> but this is just to show you what you should do if you, in theory, wanted to solve uh, the uh, Schrodinger equation for a complicated molecule. The more atoms you put in your molecule, the more this equation becomes horrendous. And in fact, to a degree, until very recently, people don't even try to do anything like this. Now, because of some understanding of how to treat uh, this problem, and also because of the uh, um, improving in uh, computers, uh, actually, you might be surprised that people can, can do these kind of things uh, even for relatively large molecules. Methane is one of the largest that at the moment has been calculated. So again, I don't want to go into detail. I just want to show you the structure. Here we have several terms. Here is the kinetic term, one for the uh, nuclei, and uh, these are for the electrons. Then I have uh, some uh, potential terms. The potential terms uh, are these two parts. They are plus because uh, uh, the nuclei with each other and the electron with each other have a repulsive potential. And, and so this is the, uh, the potential um, uh, for the uh, electrons and this is for the nuclei. And then there is an extra potential um, that is between the two and uh, nuclei slash electrons. Yes? Uh, no, no, this is a particular number and yeah, actually it, it depends on the number of electrons that you're considering, which means it depends on the number of uh, atoms that you have. So clearly this is a, is a general treatment. Uh, imagine that you have about an atom, okay? So uh, capital N is the number of atom and nuclei and uh, small n is the number of electrons. So what is uh, 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 quite powerful of the bohr oppenheimer approximation is actually that you can treat separately the nuclei from the electrons. And that actually is, uh, is really, really very handy because what you do is to start by fixing the nuclei and so not bothering about them. Um, and by doing that, then you try to find a, a solution um, for the sh this uh, Schrodinger equation that involves just electron. And to a degree, this is not so different, although it's slightly more complicated, to the equation for uh, uh, the hydrogen atom. You're doing very similar sort of uh, uh, consideration. At the end of this calculation, what you get are the uh, uh, possible uh, eigenvalues for the energy, so the energy that the electron can uh, uh, assume in this molecule. And once you have that, then you have solved just half of the problem because, of course, you have the nuclei as well. You have solved the part, basically, where you're looking at um, relatively energetic photons, the one that we were saying in, uh, before that have an energy more in the visible part of the spectrum. So to get to the nuclei, you need to, first of all, look at the potential function of the entire molecule with the uh, energy level coming from uh, 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 the um, equation of Schrodinger just for the electron, plus uh, the um, potential for the nuclei. When you say it's as easy as the hydrogen atom? Sort of. I mean, of course... Uh, well, there are many electrons, it's more complicated, right? Yes, it's more complicated, but what I mean is you're fixing the two nuclei, and so all of a sudden you're considering two nuclei as something that is, is, is not moving, and so to a degree you will have a very similar consideration and also there you have uh, energy levels that goes like 1 over n squared, so a relatively sort of similar treatment. Once again you have the potential for the entire molecule putting together the potential for the nuclei and uh, the uh, energy level for the electrons, then you can finally try to find a solution for the nuclei and it's actually by solving this equation here that then you come up with the energy level that the, your molecule can have when the two nuclei are moving. And so in particular when they're vibrating or they're rotating or they're translating. Does it make sense of this, apart from the detail? It's more scary to look at, to really l looking at what he's saying. 
So again, when I put together um, or the molecule, I have uh, the energy level which are uh, permitted for the electronic transition, for the vibration and for the rotation. Electronic transition is the one that has uh, the needs uh, uh, um, basically more energetic photons. Vibration uh, uh, needs uh, less energetic photons and rotation definitely less. Um, and so what you're looking at here are the potential transition um, from, uh, for instance, for an electronic transition from a ground state for a first excited state. But as you can see, you can also have uh, 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 other transitions that are involved in the vibration or the uh, quantum number for the rotation of your molecule. So something that we're interested in is to look at uh, what kind of uh, wavelengths and frequency uh, this transition can, can involve. And uh, 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 the visible part of the spectrum uh, is actually more related to um, uh, electronic transition, uh, the infrared uh, uh, to uh, vibration and the rotation, in particular vibration is more the near infrared and rotation is more uh, mid infrared or far infrared. Uh, and of course, the more we move into the UV, the more we're talking about uh, dissociation of the molecule uh, or um, um, uh, even ionization. So, something a bit more pictorial after all these equations. Um, vibration. What are the vibration modes that this molecule can have? Well, of course, it depends really a lot on the molecule, on the uh, um, uh, symmetries of the molecule, but what you have here is, for instance, uh, uh, just the kind of vibration mode that a molecule um, like uh, um, uh, CO2 can have. And so, as you can see, uh, depending if uh, 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 the nuclei of these atoms are moving in a symmetric stretching or asymmetric stretching, or they're moving in this way, all these basically movement um, of the nuclei can involve a transition at a particular energy. So this is another part pictorial sort of version of this uh, where you can see the, uh, the different stretching and bending of the molecule. Um, and again, this, uh, 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 all this transition correspond to a particular frequency, a particular wavelength. And so if I'm able basically of looking at photons at this particular wavelength, then I know what kind of transition I'm looking at uh, uh, for uh, um, this particular molecule. Apart from the vibration, I mentioned rotation, and this is because, uh, again, some molecules have uh, the um, uh, uh, electric dipole um, uh, that actually, um, uh, the way the charges are distributed are in a way that you can basically move around, uh, they can rotate along a certain axis, and again, all this rotation can involve a, a transition uh, at frequency in particular in the infrared. So just putting together things for uh, a few molecules. Molecules uh, like N2, O2 and CO, as you can see, <coughs> they uh, mainly have vibration modes because they're actually very symmetric in terms of uh, charges distribution. And so normally they don't really have a rotation transition. Um, uh, three atomic molecules like CO2 and N2O also are quite symmetric. They're quite linear. But when uh, you have uh, basically some vibration occurring, this vibration can sort of induce uh, electronic di dipole. And so that's how you can actually also have rotation on top of the vibration for this particular molecule. Other molecules, on the contrary, have a permanent dipole. And so because of that, it's almost natural to have uh, both vibration and also rotation. And so again, depending what are the symmetries, uh, of this molecule, you can have uh, uh, different type of transitions. Yeah, please. Absolutely. I believe, actually, I have uh, a long series of spectra, but before, <laughs> before <laughs> um, so uh, I can really show you on a spectrum, but uh, in general, we're talking about vibration in the near-infrared, and for near-infrared, I mean more or less down to 5 micron. <coughs> uh, 
um, a longer wavelengths so then usually you can induce just rotation or longer vibration of course this depends a bit on the molecule and depends on many things but indicatively near infrared is vibration and rotation is uh, uh, wavelengths longer than, than five micron or so but I will show you some some spectra where you can um, uh, see uh, uh, some better examples uh, yeah this is uh, uh, just another another way of explaining basically all these uh, 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 permitting energy states um, what we're looking at here is the uh, potential energy surface for a diatomic molecule. Um, so what is a, as a function of the internuclear distance. And so of course, what this potential tells me is that I cannot really push the two nuclei too close. At a certain point, of course, I have uh, nuclear forces which are uh, not permitting me to, to get them closer. In the contrary, if I separate the nuclei too much at a certain point, I'm almost dissociating the molecule. And in the middle, what I have uh, is something that uh, uh, for the vibration state, uh, um, um, uh, sorry, uh, for the, um, uh, the other states, I have both the vibration and the rotation. And in particular, for the vibration state, um, this would be the an approximation where I'm considering the molecule um, uh, as made of a perfect harmonic oscillator, then uh, the potential of a perfect harmonic oscillator is just a, a parabolic uh, potential, but of course uh, it's not really perfect, and so that's why actually the level um, are slightly more squeezed in this way. Okay, so just a few words about the line profile and then we get to uh, example of spectra. Um, I mentioned the fact that apart from the intensity um, uh, of the transition, actually we, we also need to worry about, about the line <coughs> profile and so what is the shape. Um, and uh, the, the fact that I need to worry about this is to start with uh, a typical lifetime for an isolated molecule is at the level of 10 to minus 8 second, which means that then I have a natural broadening um, uh, of my energy uh, that is expressed in centimeters minus 1, so a wave number, we're talking about 5, 10 to the minus 4, centimeters minus 1. So this is almost natural even for an isolated molecule. But actually, of course, molecules, uh, especially in the lower part of the atmosphere, are not isolated at all. And if you start to um, increase the pressure and the temperature, then, of course, uh, this uh, lifetime will be even more reduced. And it means that my life profile it's, it's even more, uh, is even broader. And so due to the pressure, I have some broadening, but also due to the temperature. And uh, usually, uh, the line profile has uh, uh, um, a shape which is called void profile. The void profile is obtained when you convolve a Gaussian that is due to the um, temperature uh, broadening with a Lorentzian that is linked with the pressure broadening. You obtain basically this void profile. Can I just take basic questions? Yes, please. Um, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. So, um, again, uh, in the pressure broadening, uh, the fact that the number of collision is increasing, it means that uh, the, the lifetime of uh, the single uh, molecule in that particular state is even more reduced. And so that's why you have this broadening. The reason why you have a Lorentzian is that, again, in, is in first order approximation, you can consider that as a sort of vibration of our harmonic oscillator and uh, the Lorentzian comes out when you sort of solve the equation in, uh, in, in that sense. Um, Gaussian is more uh, due to the fact that for temperature, um, for broadening due to the temperature, you have a sort of Doppler effect. And the Doppler effect is linked with velocity and to a distribution of velocity according to Maxwell Boltzmann. And that's how the Gaussian comes out. And then you put them together and you obtain this void profile. Okay, so examples. Um, these are just some examples, basically, of uh, uh, cross-sections um, that were uh, uh, obtained, measured, I believe, in this particular case, uh, for different molecules in the infrared. And so as you can see, molecules like methane, 
water, ammonia, they all have uh, some very strong uh, transitions in the infrared. Uh, uh, it, it, most of this transition here are due more to vibrations and actually wavelengths longer than phi is where actually rotation is, uh, is more prominent. I told you that uh, it's very important when you calculate this correct section to bear in mind uh, um, that you need to calculate them at the right temperature. And this is because uh, if you don't do that, you're actually missing a lot of opacity. Um, what you're looking at here as uh, some uh, calculated uh, crux section or, or very similar sort of parameter um, as a function of different temperature. And so as you can see, at 300 Kelvin, um, the transition um, can reach some... Uh, um, uh, the amplitude of the transition is much broader uh, at the minima, you can get very small uh, um, uh, number for the uh, crux section. Um, and the, the, the more the temperature is higher, the more all the um, energy level uh, actually um, are becoming more compact. And so that's, that's why actually with the increase of temperature, actually the minima uh, are coming up um, quite a lot. So. This is just to say that uh, if you're using, for instance, uh, a line list for your crux section at this temperature here, and then you're actually extrapolating on this temperature here, chances are you're doing a huge error. And most of the time we do that if we don't have the right information, but we shouldn't. Please. I'm just very curious. And yeah. the same way the are coming up, mm -hmm. Um, well, first of all, I, I'm not sure whether in this particular um, uh, representation uh, the, um, uh, the resolution is the same at low um, temperature with respect to high temperature. The effect of decreasing the resolution is actually seen less amplitude. The maxima should be more or less uh, similar. It's the minima that are coming up. So I would suspect that for this particular plot, so maybe there is a high resolution here. I haven't really plotted this. Um, uh, rather than really a, a real effect. Yeah, please. You're absolutely right, but actually what is plotted here is not necessarily something involved with a, a line profile, and so at this level shouldn't be really um, the most important effect. I can double check who produced uh, actually this because they calculate this, what is the, the reason. Yeah, the, this, this is probably a very small one. What, what I don't know is whether this <laughs> effect that you're mentioning that uh, definitely uh, might be an important effect, but is it the real effect here? I can double check and uh, uh, on the second lecture I can tell you what was the reason. No, uh, well, yes, uh, this, this is calculated, sorry. Oh no, these are real features. These are real features. Actually, what I should have mentioned, this is actually a line list uh, for uh, a methane at hot temperature that contains a, a 10 power 10 transition. In fact, that's why they call it 10 to 10. So this is not error. This is actually all single transition. There are so many that they're quite packed. Yes? is more distributed. That, that might be the reason. Mm -hmm. That might be the reason. Again, I will definitely check.
just for in case of methane, but in general, do you think that the lab physics is rich enough? Do, 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 we, do, do we have good enough values to use for uh, an observation? Uh, the answer is it depends on the molecule, and actually it's a very good question. What I will do is when I cover observation, I will show you more or less uh, the table of molecules that are more or less okay to the one on the contrary, we know that we have some problems. The bigger is the molecule, the more transition you have, the, the, the bigger is the, uh, the problem as well. Um, today, I think uh, up to methane, so we, we start to talk about five atoms, you start to have uh, a combination of calculated and uh, uh, lab measurement that putting them together start to give us a relatively good um, description. But for whatever molecule that is larger than that, then you just have observations. And observation alone, similarly to calculation alone, are less precise. Um, so bottom line, there are many molecules for which we, st we still don't have the right information. And again, I will probably uh, show the, the, um, the list um, when I talk about observation. Talking about incomplete line list, this is just an example. This is a line list uh, of, uh, for ammonia uh, at room temperature. So we're not even touching the high temperature where the problem is actually uh, bigger. And uh, this is high trans, so measured line list. And this is the calculated one. So even at room temperature, you see that in the measured one, there you're missing an uh, entire part of the spectrum, entire opacities. And, and so for all the molecules where we have incomplete information, um, uh, it means that when you try to interpret a spectrum, you normally um, introduce an error because you're missing some of the input information. Okay, so back to the atmospheres. How we can use all this information now uh, to, to probe the atmosphere. So, um, I would like, what I would like to do in the next few minutes is actually to show you, uh, well, first of all, uh, tell you what, uh, what we, we should bother about uh, uh, all this information. Yes? So why do we still have an absorption when, when the temperature gradient is already uh, above the third box? Uh, uh, yes, uh, okay, so actually this one should go here, but this was just to show what happens when you have, uh, um, uh, I, I want to discuss exactly this, so let's, let's go back uh, in, in one minute to this, to this point. What I wanted to discuss right now is actually how we couple this information about a molecule with the thermal structure in the infrared. And again, to answer to this question, we go back uh, basically to this equation applied to the atmosphere, which is the solution to the uh, Swarshield equation. What the equation tells me is that uh, if uh, uh, I am an observer and I put myself at the top of the atmosphere and I basically look down, what I will receive is, first of all, the um, uh, intensity of the radiation coming from the surface, S is the surface, which of course it has gone through all the layers of atmosphere before arriving to the observer, and so it needs to be multiplied by this transmissivity term. Um, but then, each of the layers of the atmosphere will emit uh, with a temperature, T, at that particular level, as a black body, and each layer will then have to go through this level of transmissivity to whatever atmosphere there is on top of that layer. So it's in here, basically, that if I have some molecule uh, in my optical depth with uh, some cross section, uh, they can basically be absorbed, um, uh, they can basically absorb the photons uh, at that level of the atmosphere with that particular temperature. So effectively, when I go down, depending on which wavelengths I'm looking at, I will see deeper in the atmosphere or higher up. Why so? Well, at each wavelength, if I have some molecule that are absorbing at that particular wavelength, is the absorption is, is very efficient, it means that I cannot see through the atmosphere. The atmosphere is very opaque, and so the maximum level at which I'm looking at is relatively close to me observer. If on the contrary, 
at the particular wavelength I have no absorption or the absorption is uh, relatively mild, it means that at a particular wavelength I can see down the atmosphere, in some cases even through the surface, and so the atmosphere is particularly transparent. So if I use this information, I can basically trace not only which molecule and which concentration uh, is absorbing, but also at which point of the atmosphere uh, my optical depth become uh, basically opaque, and so I cannot see through any longer. So if I apply this uh, to the thermal profile of the atmosphere, and what I have here is a thermal profile of the Earth, um, when the temperature is decreasing with altitude, if I look basically at the center of my line where my cross section is the maximum, I will see higher in the atmosphere. So my center of the line will see up here, for instance. The wings, on the contrary, will see down here uh, just because the atmosphere is more transparent. <coughs> and the net effect is to see my molecule like an absorption. So if I see an absorption, what I can say, haha, the temperature is decreasing with altitude because of this effect. On the contrary, if the temperature is increasing with altitude, again, center of the line sees through a certain point, the wings go deeper, and so it means that I'm seeing a, basically a hotter temperature in the center and a lower temperature in the wings. It means that I'm seeing that particular uh, molecule in emission. And again, if I see a particular transition in emission, then <coughs> I know that the temperature is increasing with altitude. If I have a black body, I basically don't see anything. And the reason being, the center and the wings have the same temperature, and so I'm not able really to distinguish. So you're right, actually, this diagram here should go up here uh, in, the meso in the mesosphere. Uh, when actually the, the temperature is decreasing with altitude. I, I copy and paste from another presentation, so presumably in doing that I must have mixed <laughs> a bit this. So let's have a look uh, at uh, an example um, of a spectrum in the infrared for the Earth. Um, so as you can see in the infrared, in the infrared uh, we can see uh, uh, many molecules which are absorbing in the Earth's atmosphere. Let's focus one second on the CO2 and uh, in ozone. Do you think that this particular um, uh, spectral features for CO2 and this one in O2, what does it say about the thermal profile? Do you think the molecule is emission or absorption? Well, I, I wanted to start from, from the center, but you're right, it's both. <laughs> is both because actually um, the center of the line of the CO2 um, uh, it's basically um, uh, in the center of the line is, is, is so efficient that I can see basically down to the stratosphere and so the very center is in emission because I'm basically looking at the stratosphere and uh, I believe that here yes CO2 you see basically in the stratosphere. Um, and so that's why I'm seeing it in emission because the temperature is increasing with altitude. The wings actually are going down here in the troposphere where actually the temperature is decreasing with altitude. And that's why I'm seeing them in emission. So uh, he's absolutely right. The CO2 and also ozone uh, are seen in uh, absorption and emission because they're registering this uh, thermal inversion. Um, something easier, water is an absorption or emission. Yes, uh, is an absorption, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, we are seeing down uh, to this level of atmosphere. Um, actually, after a few spectra, I guess uh, everybody starts to see it. Maybe I should have started. <laughs> I should have started by Titan. <laughs> Are these features in emission or absorption? Yes. There is a strong stratosphere on Titan, and that's why you're seeing all these Q branches in emission. Also, the 
<laughs> no, actually, no. <laughs> actually, it's not correct. This is uh, sometimes you say a mission in. Uh, I mean, we say a mission in uh, in a confusing way because this is the oral emission by the planet, but this is the emission seen by the single molecule. So yeah, but you see, you you really see the emission pretty well. Um, maybe this one is easier. Um, Mars, what is doing the CO two? Absorption, because again, we don't have a stratosphere on Mars, and so <coughs> we're looking down in the troposphere. Venus. Oh, you see, two spectra, and you got it. <laughs> so actually, this is a, um, it's a very powerful way, again, not just to identify uh, molecules uh, that are absorbing in the infrared, but also really get an insight uh, um, on the. Um, I have a. But Oh yes. Well, yes. Otherwise if you at this resolution, yes, absolutely, uh, so I agree. No, but but it's right because uh, you could be confused if you don't know the entire profile, especially if you are quite broad in it and low resolution. It's uh, it's tricky. Well, well, I think. Well, actually, this spectra, to be fair, this spectra are not particularly high resolution. Um, so, you know, the day that we get close to this, and of course, you're right in saying that today are far from being close to this. Today is probably very hard. But, you know, next generation of instrument uh, should, uh, at least for some molecule, uh, potentially uh, get close to that, hopefully. Uh, well, because there is, uh, okay, in the case of Venus, uh, we have uh, uh, an atmosphere that is completely made of CO2 and 90 bar of pressure. Uh, and so, as you can imagine, the column density for CO2 is really very strong. Mars has a much thinner atmosphere, but still, it's mainly made of CO2. Um, and in both cases, the reason also why you're seeing so well this feature is because they have extremely little, almost negligible water. As soon as you inject a bit of water vapor, water vapor has a, such a strong absorption that it starts to eat up uh, um, some of the features, and so you <coughs> see less well uh, some of this. So it's a combination of having a lot of CO2 in those planets and the fact that there is extremely little water, and so you can see some of the transition much better because they don't interfere with water. Incidentally, also in the Earth's atmosphere, the reason why we're seeing so well the CO2 at 50 micron is because uh, uh, water condenses uh, um, at lower level, uh, so at the level where this is uh, absorbing, uh, we have at the level 10 to the minus five, uh, 4, sorry, a uh, mixing ratio of water. If we had water vapor as abundant as close to the surface, all up to the atmosphere, it would be much more difficult even for the Earth to see uh, these, these emissions so purely, so beautifully. Yeah. So, if I remember correctly, people have observed sodium emission lines in exo Yes. Please correct me. No, 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 it's absolutely correct. Um, does that mean um, the exo also have a stratosphere, or, or, or is sodium lines just a non-local similar? A very good, a very good question. Um, I think the. Uh, in the next lecture, we will look at observation. We will also look at how all this bit more theoretical um, background can apply to the single observation. And actually, sodium has been uh, found, and you're absolutely right, in many hot Jupiter at this point, but always in transit. So basically, when the planet is passing in front of the star. And in that case, we're not really looking at spectra emitted or reflected, but spectra transmitting. Just transmitted. So basically, or the light coming from the star goes through the atmosphere, and you see the feature in transmission. So that doesn't apply to transmission spectra. So this just apply basically when you look at uh, spectra emitted by the planet. So it's a different geometry. Okay. Very last thing on infrared spectra. Um, another quiz. 
Uh, these are free spectra, which are expressed in brightness temperature rather than um, uh, intensity of radiation, uh, recorded from satellite for the Earth. And as you can see, they're very different. Um, this one here has been observed uh, um, uh, on top of the Sahara Desert, this on top uh, um, mid-latitude, and this on top of the pole. They're very, very different. Who knows why they are so different? Yes, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't supposed to be a quiz, so I just put the solution right there. Well spotted, yes, the thermograded. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, so they're so different, not because uh, the concentration of this molecule changes so much, but because the thermogradient is very different. And since we're probing uh, the thermal gradient together with the concentration, that's why we're seeing them, uh, and they're so different. So on top of the poles, the uh, atmospheric thermal structure is much more uh, um, uh, isothermal. On top of the, 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 the Sahara Desert, there is a huge gradient, and so that's why we're seeing this, this feature so, so strongly. OK, um, I think I have 10 minutes. And in the next 10 minutes, I will go through very quickly what happened um, at the level of uh, uh, scattering uh, properties and so more the visible. And so uh, basically here what we're looking at here is the uh, percent of reflectance that you, uh, first of all, for the Earth, for instance, to the old planet, and then depending um, uh, a different material on the surface, uh, then as you can see, the albedo, so the properties integrated over the visible wavelength to reflect back the radiation really changes quite a lot. And uh, as a functional wavelength, then uh, each surface has its own way to reflect back or to absorb photons. So again, uh, in theory, if you're looking at a planet and the planet has a surface and you have little no atmosphere and you have a very beautiful instrument, in theory, you should be able to pick up um, some of these uh, a feature and understand more or less what is the material on the surface. This is certainly being done uh, for objects in the solar system. And uh, I, um, uh, I realize that for exosolar planet is a, is a bit tricky to get uh, this information down to the surface. But again, in theory, this is, this is what is possible. Um, I told you that uh, um, photons in the visible are, um, uh, in many cases, uh, scattered. Uh, meaning that basically what is really changing is the direction. So the incoming light has this direction, and then after scattering, uh, the, the, the photon is diffused in a, in a different part of the atmosphere. Of course, the scattering can be just one photon. So basically, one photon is scattered once. And this really happens when you have a very thin uh, media or very thin atmosphere. Most of the time, <coughs> as soon as you have uh, optically thick uh, sort of uh, um, uh, medium, and particularly atmosphere, then you have multiple scattering. So basically, the photon that is coming in go through multiple scattering before being either ejected back to space or being absorbed in some way by the atmosphere or the surface. So. Um, the kind of parameters that are sort of guiding the scattering or for of course the wavelength of the incident direction uh, radiation sorry then uh, this parameter that is called the size parameter where we're basically comparing the wavelength of the photons the incident photons with the uh, uh, size of the particle and uh, depending if uh, uh, this uh, size parameter is uh, much less than one or about one or um, or uh, uh, really very big, the way basically uh, we're looking at scattering with a different scattering regime. And when this parameter is very small, that's where we have Rayleigh scattering. So typically molecule in an atmosphere can produce Rayleigh scattering because of this reason. We have miscattering when on the contrary we start to have particles that are the size of slightly bigger or smaller than uh, the wavelength on the photons. And in this regime, on the contrary, when you have a very big <coughs> particle compared to the wavelength of the photons, we're in a regime of geometric uh, optics. Uh, sorry, not geometric, yeah, geometric optics. 
Um, another important parameter is actually the refractive index of the medium, because of course uh, this, this scattering is not happening in, in the empty space, uh, but is actually happening um, uh, for, the, for the atmosphere is happening in a gas, and so of course we need to have a look at the uh, refractive index of the gas. Um, so uh, this is just to show you, uh, given that I told you that the size uh, of the particles is very important compared to the wavelengths of the photons, just to give you an idea of what kind of uh, particles we can assume. And I'll show you a couple of examples for the Earth. But again, of course, uh, you change the planet, you change the condition, and things, uh, 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 of course, can change. But this is just to, as an illustration. Um, when we're talking about aerosol, as you can see, we can have radii that goes uh, uh, from 10 to the minus 2 micron to uh, a few tens of microns and they can have uh, uh, different shapes depending how they form. Uh, even high crystals uh, um, can be uh, uh, relatively, can, can produce relatively large particles. Um, for instance, uh, this is the size of some ice crystals in the Earth's atmosphere and uh, we can reach uh, uh, 1,000 micron or so. And as you can imagine, even droplets uh, or condensates, of course, can create particles that are uh, non-negligible compared to the wavelengths of the photons. Uh, this is just a table showing what is the size uh, uh, parameter and what is the, sorry, yes, what the size parameter. And uh, uh, when, it, when we compare, basically, the size of the particle to the wavelength at in the visible, mid-infrared, and... Uh, um, um, microwave um, and of course the size parameter change uh, with the wavelengths of the photons we're looking at. Uh, meaning all this, if we want to see through an atmosphere, maybe uh, 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 the particular wavelength we want to select to do that is important because then it means that the size parameter will change and so um, uh, having um, uh, radiation a longer wavelength or shorter wavelength might be important depending on what we want to measure. Uh, what is usually very important in particular is the scattering phase function. Uh, so basically is the direction towards which uh, the scatter photons is going. And uh, here at the bottom we have basically what happened for Rayleigh scattering. Uh, typically f when the incoming radiation is unpolarized you tend to have this sort of symmetric situation with the forward and backward uh, sort of radiation. The more the size parameter is bigger, as you can see, the forward direction starts to be much more important. And when you have multiple scattering, of course, you need to integrate over all the possible cases. And as you can see, then it makes a huge difference um, depending what are the particles in the atmosphere and what is happening. Um, so we, we already, well, you've probably seen uh, in, in course in our, in our places uh, that uh, the, um, uh, the cross-section for Rayleigh scattering goes like 1 over lambda power 4. And again, typically uh, the uh, phase function, so the distribution um, of the scattering uh, photons is uh, <coughs> along the forward and the backward radiation, uh, sorry, directions. Um, on the contrary, with bigger particles, we're in the mi regime, and as you can see, the larger it is, the more the scattering um, uh, direction, the, the more the forward direction becomes important. Yes, please. Um, well, actually, for scattering, it's more the size and also the shape. Uh, I haven't really discussed the shape, but the shape certainly have an impact. It is true that this particle uh, cannot, I mean, they do not only scatter, they can also absorb uh, the, 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 the radiation in a certain sense. So, um, yeah, what I was trying to say is that I'm just describing the scattering process, but it's not necessarily the only one that is, um, uh, is involved in the, uh, in the radiation. So I'm personally not too much aware of some uh, trans transmittance uh, of transparent droplets. Yeah, but this is actually a huge issue, and people are studying this okay, in so the atmosphere of the Earth, and not just around ice particles, but also around uh, dust particles. So it's an 
excellent point and not a well solved one because people are working on it pretty hard. Yeah, I was not aware of that, so mm -hmm. thanks. Uh, in computer simulations, uh, in this pattern regime, is it safe for, well, the same time, it's, it's best, better to somehow properly scatter it. Uh, is it safer to, well, in the regime, if that's very uh, basically that, is it safer to assume that there's no scattering at all and you just uh, transfer the array, or basically that it's a really scattering plus, well, if it's a very strong forward scattering, maybe it's better just ignore it altogether? Uh, so the question is whether it's safer to put uh, Rayleigh instead of nothing. Yeah. Uh, well, Rayleigh typically is, should be always there just because if you have some gas in the atmosphere, then you, know, you can't really take that out. Then uh, um, it's, it's a big question what to do with uh, potential aerosol or, or, or clouds because depending on what uh, parameters you're assuming for your cloud, uh, sorry, with your particle distribution, particle size, and so on and so forth, you get some, some very some huge differences, both in reflection or in transmission. Um, and so uh, there is not really a general theory that tells you what you should do if you don't know what is happening. Uh, what you're hoping uh, is to look at observation that tell you more or less uh, uh, what is the situation, but the number of parameters you need to assume to, to create a cloud model are so many that to be precise is, is very tough. It's very tough because, I mean, you, you, there are some um, uh, assumptions you need to make where you put your aerosol, where you put the clouds, how thick it is, <coughs> uh, and so on and so forth, that uh, can really change uh, quite a lot the... Uh, the um, uh, the answer. So I think my time is over. So the last slide uh, I can show is just the uh, geometric optics, just to finish, meaning when the particle is really big compared to the uh, photons, and then uh, that's how you, uh, well, in geometric optics approximation, you use all the uh, <coughs> typical rule of, of optics, and uh, that's how you explain rainbows and halos and so on and so forth. Okay, thank you very much. about the uh, spectra of uh, the different molecules. Uh, I'm confident, or I, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, a well-qualified uh, uh, person can forward model, the forward model the Earth's atmosphere and get the observed Earth's spectra. Can you do it by backwards? Can you backward model the Earth's atmosphere? Actually, that's what I was uh, considering treating in the second lecture. I want to do a bit of observation, and uh, to interpret those spectra, you need to do inverse model. So from the spectrum, uh, going back to the parameter, and as you can imagine, it's, it's very hard because for extrasolar planets, these parameters are extremely degenerate. Of course, when it comes to the Earth or planets that we know better, then the inverse process is, uh, is less degenerate. Um, uh, but uh, if you don't mind, uh, I will go through this uh, inverse model in uh, second lectures. So, uh, what's the pra uh, practical limitation on um, for people getting more and more experiment experimental data for this op opacity for different molecules at, hi at high de temperatures? A very good question. Well, you need to set up a lab uh, for that, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, sometimes molecules do not cooperate that much. If you try to put a molecule that is uh, uh, mm, uh, particularly reactive, a very high temperature, you need to really have a solid lab. So, you know, not all the molecules are so easy to, to measure. In some other cases, you don't have maybe incident like that, but uh, uh, maybe uh, you need to set up your experiment in a way that when you do the measurement, then you start to have uh, um, uh, some error bars. Uh, more in general, for people who are measuring um, uh, a line list, the difficulty, the difficulty is not to get the right uh, um, um, frequency at which the transition is happening. What is very difficult is to calibrate the overall intensity. Whereas for people that are calculating line list, they get uh, the intensity spot on. 
but sometimes they have some error bars um, uh, um, in determining the precise frequency at which this is happening. So ideally, you really want to have both um, because uh, 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 one can help the other. Uh, if you have the theory behind, then you can uh, normalize better the uh, intensity from your experiment. If you have the experiment, then you can feed back what you know of the molecule into the theory. So the molecules that are known the best that are basically coming from both sides. But in general, it's quite expensive to make uh, um, lab measurements, and so that's why there are not so many. Yeah. Also about uh, absorption cross-sections. If you have measured cross-sections at low temperature and you're trying to extrapolate them to high temperature, would you generally expect that you're then going to underestimate the true cross-section of the gas? Uh, it's a very good question. I, I, I'm afraid I went through that uh, in all these years that I tried to interpret spectral exosolar planet because many of these line lists are quite recent and so in the past uh, we, we did our best to try to understand uh, what to do. Uh, to a degree, yes, but just to a degree because uh, as you have seen, sometimes the minima are really sort of uh, coming up um, at high temperature and so in a sense, uh, it's not really obvious that you're just underestimating or overestimating. Um, and, and then, in some cases, at low temperature, you're just missing some transitions. So, so there is no way you can extrapolate at higher temperature. So, uh, in yeah. Should, but again, since the shape is also changing a bit at high temperature, it's, it's not really obvious you say, okay, you're always underestimating, or uh, so um, it's, uh, it's, it's a hard question. And then the question is by, by how much you're underestimating, or if, if you look at this uh, very quickly, yeah, uh, look, there are some order of magnitude difference here, and an order of magnitude or two or three there then uh, comes back to, to your optical depth. Um, so uh, it can be a huge error in the estimation, of course, of the, um, uh, of the number density and concentration of your molecule. <laughs> okay, let's thank uh, Giovanni. We have a break now until...